Hello fellow Bastions, it's Lynn Hilton here with Kaya Hosted Carney. We're two of the trainers at Bast. And we're both going a little mad, Kaya a bit more than I am because she's been stuck indoors self-isolating. <laughs> <laughs> so she's going to stir crazy. <laughs> and we've been both getting quite a lot of questions from other singing teachers about teaching online. And we realised, well, we don't cover that on uh, the course. And this would be a great opportunity for us to actually help you guys find ways of continuing to work when you're stuck either indoors or restricted because students can't come to you. Um, not only, obviously, through this rather dire time um, of the COVID-19 virus, but actually it's just a really good tool to add to your arsenal of teaching tools anyway. So we're going to cover why you should teach online, how it differs from offline teaching, who it works for and who it might not work for, when and where you should teach online, and the kind of resources, platforms and strategies you might need to give a great line, online lesson. And also we've put together some 10 top tips for you and we're also going to be uh, creating a PDF that's going to accompany this webinar that will be full of other resources that will be helpful to you. So why? Well, hello, where have you been? On a meditation retreat with Jared Leto? Because apparently he was off on a meditation retreat and hadn't heard anything about the COVID-19 virus and um, so came out of that retreat 10 days later, was totally shocked at the changes in the world. I'm sure you haven't been, but if you have, good luck with you. Um, or have small children. Yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe it's you've been stuck in, you know, somewhere kidnapped or something. But anyway, most people I think know that uh, right now we're going through this crisis and a lot of students and teachers are stopping their lessons because they're trying to reduce the amount of contact they have with other human beings so other than that, it also will broaden your potential market way beyond your local area. You know, I teach, and, and as does Kaya, people overseas, um, as well as within our country. So it just means that we don't have to be focusing on just our local market. It's a great alternative choice if you've got clients that can't travel to you for some reason. For um, a professional client, it might be because they're on tour or it might be because somebody's um, got something else on and they can't afford the time it takes to travel to you. So actually just set up an online lesson. They don't have to do the traveling and they still get their lesson um, for the day or the week. Some students actually find it more comfortable working from their own environment. And that's a sort of a, an additional benefit that I hadn't really thought about when I started teaching. And when I gave that option to a couple of people, they said, oh, actually, I really like it because then I don't have to, you know, get dressed to go out. I can just um, have a lesson, you know, with a nice top on. <laughs> um, yes, we don't really want to know what's going on underneath. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's also a great alternative for you if you don't have somewhere to teach. So maybe you teach in a studio once a week, but you want to be able to teach on other days of the week, but you don't necessarily have the opportunity um, to work from a venue. So it's a great opportunity, you know, using the online mark, um, platform to actually continue teaching, uh, but without the overheads, obviously, of a venue. And of course, it means that you can be flexible with your hours as well, and also with your location. So Kaya, I know you teach from all sorts of funny places. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm kind of commuting between Norway, Liverpool, London, and being able to kind of see my clients regularly uh, has been a great benefit to that and also run the best courses from various locations. So um, I've started to have a, a, a mutual, uh, not mutual love affair. I don't know how the platforms feel about me. <laughs> but but also things like a student um, being in the studio, uh, being able to kind of warm them up, um, 
feeling comfortable to just go, oh yeah, of course we can do it on that Saturday, even though you are actually doing something else that day, but because you don't have to travel there to the studio or warming them up, you can actually just be getting on with it and then kind of get on with the rest of your day afterwards. So it's very flexible in that way. Yeah. So there are some differences obviously to working online to offline and we've just listed here a few things um, that we think are relevant and uh, Kaya would you like to sort of take people through the negatives positives and some things to take note of? Yes yeah, so it's in a negative way it's obviously impacted by the internet connection um, both yours and also the client student uh, and the quality of camera and audio so it can sometimes feel like a barrier, especially if somebody is um, a little bit of a, of a technophobe, it's specifically challenging for them. And also uh, there are some certain things that you need to think about in regards to latency or ducking of sound. So if you both try and speak at the same time, I mean, if, if me and Lynn, if we try and say something, um, <laughs> at the same time, one, yeah, two, one, two, three, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the sound will go up and down and trying to kind of it'll give the person with the the large sound the uh, advantage so if somebody's got a dog um and you're trying to explain something then that for instance that barking might come through um however positive if you have good headphones and and there's generally good uh, internet you can hear different details of the voice that you wouldn't normally hear because obviously when you're in an acoustic space or a, a room rehearsal room anything um, the the sound you hear will always be affected by the acoustics of the space and hearing something directly well obviously you will hear some of the acoustics of the space but you'll still hear overtones you'll hear like certain timbres and um, you might pay more attention to breaths coming through and like, like leakage of the breath in the vocal form things like that um, actually just on that point i remember working with a student who i'd been working with offline and we did a an online class or lesson and because i was wearing headphones i suddenly noticed some tension that i'd never noticed when i was working with them when they were in front of me i think sometimes it really kind of focuses your ear into the voice and you end up hearing things that you hadn't noticed you know with the person actually standing in front of you and the distraction of the physicality of somebody there for sure and and actually because you might not like pay attention to all the other things you have normally in your studio you you you're you're very much looking into the computer and you might see like vowel positions and tongue positions that you normally would have been distracted with what they're doing with their hands or like random things like that um and the flip side of that is you might not see what they're doing with their feet because they're you're seeing them from here and up and you know it might be a good thing for them to step back but then that affects the audio um there's i love the flexibility of the stu um, student and teacher to be able to be anywhere uh for various i mean at the moment i am literally today yesterday and tomorrow i am working for the academy that i do some work for in norway but I'm sitting at my kitchen table or a dining room table in Liverpool and they are getting taken care of even though they're all self-isolating because all the schools are close to Norway. Um, the big one, and I actually thought that was even more of a, a plus when I was in London, the saving time and cost on travel, which means it's less likely to run over and, and, and time's running late. Uh, I remember when I first moved to London a few years ago, the fact that anywhere takes 45 minutes at least to get to, even if it's down the road. So all these kind of transport uh, disruptions might mean, you know, you, you lose a five minute here and five minute there, all of a sudden you lost your lunch break. So it's, it's great in that kind of thing that you have somebody waiting in the waiting room, um, some of the platforms allow a waiting room feature and by the time you kind of know that oh we're coming up to this time you can just like say a quick oh it's lovely to see you bye well that's a lot harder if you're in a studio with somebody and they've been traveling an hour to get to you so there is an element of that especially if you're a particularly 
social and chatty. Uh, and in these times, particularly the barrier to viral infections, I would say we've got a very dangerous job having people going <laughs> at you all day. And yeah, that's a, a great plus. Also, if a student saying, oh, I think I might have a throat infection in a normal studio, you might go, okay, please stay at home. But if, they, if, if there's a might, you might be able to kind of assess their voice and, and help them get along without kind of putting yourself and your other students at risk. Um, it's worth thinking about things like safeguarding and GDPR. Um, if you are in EU territory with the GDPR, um, that's got to do with like keeping things. So if you like, for instance, now, Lynn, you're recording the webinar. So um, uh, the fact that you're recording, I have allowed you to keep my <laughs> uh, details and my imagery. If I was under 18, I couldn't have just said that you are allowed to. Um, there has to be parental um, guardian um, permission. Permission, that's the word. <laughs> um, and you might have to think about a, a form that you do uh, for um, uh, parents and it could even include the fact that you could have a parent or guardian uh, in on the session without actually being on camera or being able to talk so they could observe it's probably a good idea i know that mu and the uh, association for singing teachers have some guidelines regarding safeguarding but the whole thing about having closed doors um, in real world would be similar thing, uh, making sure that the student isn't kind of locked in their own bedroom and things like that. Uh, we'll try and find some links to include in the PDF uh, so that we, yeah. you can look more into that. Mm. I think that's it. <laughs> well, the other thing we were talking about earlier was that it does help when we start with an offline lesson first. So getting to know the student. For in, sure. You know, in an offline lesson because it can be a bit intimidating for a singer who's never sung you know without a piano accompaniment or um who's you know worried about being on camera so sometimes you can build that trust on offline help them understand and get them used to the scales because as we're going to talk about in a second we're going to have to adjust the way we accompany our students when we're working online yeah so if that's possible but I mean I was talking earlier about the fact that I back in the day was used to teach on the telephone over the phone and I worked with a guy young guy from Scotland and we were working on the over the phone for a year so I never saw him I only ever heard him and I managed to get him through two transitions um, before I ever met him in person. So, you know, it is possible to do this stuff even on the phone. Uh, it's not ideal, but don't be put off by the idea. You know, don't stop yourself, I think is the important thing here. And, and exactly the same reason, like even without all this threats of the virus and everything, I'm from a very small place in the north of Norway and we had two singing teachers if you know <laughs> if you're from an even smaller place there might not even be a singing teacher or there might be just an opera singer and you want to do pop or it might just be one person who's doing musical theater and you you want to do opera you know like that this is a way of, of actually accessing a wider pool of skill set and i've always enjoyed like in my training and throughout my my, my years in various organizations and various type of training up I've enjoyed the fact that I can reach wider uh, cast the net wider in regards to training than what I would have been able to do in my local market yeah why is that not going forward <laughs> okay so who does this work for and who might it not work for so obviously very te tech savvy people will be fine with all this touring singers I've definitely worked with people who are on tour um, because they can't get to you and they may want to maintain their voice or maybe there's some stuff going on with their voice that they need adjusting or changing or listening to. Uh, so it's important for them to have access to you quite readily. Isolated singers, as um, Kaya was just saying. And of course, busy students will appreciate this because they may not have the time it, you know, to travel to you. 
It may not be for people who are technophobes. Now, that could be the teacher as much as the student. I would like to think that um, the best teachers are willing to at least give it a go. Um, but there may be some students uh, who will not be convinced that they can manage to have a lesson. There have been times when I've worked with students who have gone, oh no, you know, I'm so technically sort of um, inept and it'll never work for me. I have to have it in person. And then there's been, in fact, it's happening on Saturday, this student who's always been very against the idea of having um, lessons online has finally consented to having this online lesson because I don't want to travel to London and also their school has closed down. And so I have a feeling she'll probably, like many of my other experiences, come back to me and go, oh, actually, that was a lot easier than I thought, you know. So try and encourage your students to at least give it one go. And you can always give them a free session. You could always say, let's just do 20 minutes uh, and see how you feel. And then, you know, they don't feel like they're making some sort of financial commitment. Obviously, if you've got poor internet connection or they do, then this is going to be really problematic. Um, poor technical facilities. So, you know, it's difficult if you don't have a decent mic. Um, camera, you can do without a camera from uh, your point of view. It's nice when they see you, but it's not as important as it is for you to be seeing them. And I've definitely done that in the past when there's been poor internet connection. I've turned off my camera so that there's not so much bandwidth being used. And then it means I, I focus on them and then I just turn the camera on on the odd occasion. The point of that, it, it, by the way, um, sometimes if people are like, especially the traveling touring singer, if they are in a hotel room on the free internet, it's much better for them if they can afford and if they um, have the data package to go on their 4G or and then it is doing a, a kind of public internet or a student um, student accommodation internet. Mm. So if they are able to um, do mobile internet, I, I find that's generally much quicker than the average parent's internet connection. <laughs> Yeah, like including me running the course from my mother's house uh, in Norway a, a few times I realized that oh I actually need to tether on my phone because the kind of amount of bandwidth that I'm taking is not what my mother needs on an average basis so mm -hmm. I think that's the same for a lot of students um, mm -hmm. the 4G mobile network will be quicker yeah, I mean, I've definitely been in situations where the student's been kind of chasing the internet, trying to find the right spot. And actually going back to that student I was working with over the phone, because um, he was in this remote area of Scotland um, and he was still at school. And there was one lesson where he was literally leaning out of the window to find this spot that was, you know, the sweet spot for his connection, doing his lip drills. And I was sitting there... <laughs> really worried that he was going to end up falling out the window so it's not really ideal but obviously that's a funny story um yeah and also of course people have to be able to find a private space to be working from because they're going to be making weird noises and <laughs> when you're working from home it's maybe you know not as accessible to them and people might be coming in and out of the room as well so that could be a problem if if the if the student can't find somewhere to have the lesson in private. So when and where should you teach online? We are of the opinion that whenever is convenient to you uh, in a space that's private, well lit and where you won't be disturbed. You know, it's basically wherever is, you know, and whenever. So Kaya, do you want to run through what some of the basics are to getting started and set up yes and i think uh, i'll do two versions of it this is like the ideal situation you would want um, a computer that's set up with a, a internet connection a good webcam and a microphone that's either um, internal or preferably through a um, um a device so you, i mean there's plug-in mics usb mics if you yeah there you go she's showing her big 
microphone. Blue Yeti. Uh, Blue Yeti. <laughs> um, or into audio interface. So like, I mean, I have one that I use. Um, it's literally, this could be this fancy one, but I could also just use like my normal live mic because I've got a, my travel kit uh, when it comes to mic is uh, one of these. I'm not going to promote any particular, but this just goes in to through the uh, headphone and, and on that side there's an XLR. Uh, my home setup, that's my home setup. Uh, my studio setup is an audio interface like I would use for doing demo recordings. Um, however, right now I'm just recording through my computer mic because um, I forgot to bring my, um, my mic stand home and I thought, well, actually there's gonna be more disruption trying to set anything up. Uh, I am on a Mac, Mac's internal, um, audio both camera and audio are generally quite advanced yeah uh, and with a lot of students you're better off having them use their smartphone than for them to get on their cheapish laptops or and th th this is not a, a snobby kind of thing but like you know some workbooks are meant for word processing and products that are not audio interface and video, and video so, yeah because that takes up quite a lot of ram the other thing is that don't dismiss the good old earbuds that come with the uh, smartphone for, for sure especially uh, especially for the the microphone side of it mm. um you know in with older phones and when i say older i literally mean two years because this is how quick the technology moves you're better off using the hands-free set whilst the newer has really super um camera and sound like better than my HD camera from three years ago. So things are moving very quickly. Yeah. It is absolutely crazy. Um, headphones are great for you to hear that absolutely like minuscule detail. Um, students using headphones, it depends what quality they have. Um, because if they have like Bluetooth headphone, for instance, uh, most Bluetooth headphones will try and use the headphones as the microphone and it'll have a delay not only going in but also going to you so you have like a three and then you have the normal internet delay so you then you've got a four point delay so generally if if they say oh i've got bluetooth headphones just say oh that's fine we'll go without headphones generally uh i have not yet to see um uh, great bluetooth uh headphones work in this um yeah setting i should say mm. Uh, but keyboard, of course, if you have a, a keyboard, you are able to do, um, you're able to, to kind of give the first chord. Um, you, however, you might just, I'm just looking up my phone, I'm just, just, just checking Facebook, but like I might be able to give you the chord on my, like just like a, a piano app. Mm -hmm. uh, there's loads of them out there, they're mainly free. Um, obviously, <laughs> the fingers are much bigger than that, but I might go. Generally, I'd rather give the chord and then whoa, 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 whatever the scale or hmm. syllable that you were giving. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I've, keyboard is definitely desirable. If you are normally key teaching my keyboard, you probably feel much more comfortable having your keyboard there. But if if somebody calls me and I'm, you know, on an airport somewhere and, and they're going, oh, I'm having a, a, an issue with my voice and I'm in the studio in two hours, can you help? I'm not gonna go, I don't have a keyboard. It's not gonna happen. I, I'll have a keyboard for reference to know if you are in the critical bridge, if we're higher, if we're lower. Um, but it's a tool after all. Yeah, and if you're going to go for a keyboard and you want to get one specifically for this kind of thing, you don't need to have the full um, amount of keys. So like this Alesis is really handy because it's very light. I can take it with me wherever I go. It's USB connected and then um, it then uh, basically takes the sound, uh, the piano sound from GarageBand. And if I'm working with females, I'll just change the, I'll just transpose it up uh, so that I can start sort of around, so that G, G, so the middle C becomes that sort of low, not the lowest C, but the second lowest C that's on that keyboard. 
and mm. um, that gives me room to then work up to the top end of the voice. And then when I'm working with males, I put it back to its normal transposition. Um, very simple, easy, light, not too expensive. Um, but that's that's a good point. Also, if you're using a keyboard app, you know the fact that I can go and then I can move the same. So I'm I'm transposing. Mm. You know, have something where you know where you're at because you know what kind of things to expect certain parts of people's range. And if mm. if you don't have a reference point, that's going to be a guesstimation. Okay, so when it comes to platforms, you've got quite a few options here. Uh, Kai and I are particularly um, enamoured with uh, Zoom, so we're going to go into that a little bit more. But you could also use Skype, though you'll need some sort of uh, recorder so that you can record the lesson, and that's extra, an extra uh, bit of software that you need to buy. Uh, Facebook Messenger, FaceTime, WhatsApp, and Google Hangouts. Now, all of them have their pros and cons. Most of them don't have any kind of recording facilities. And, you know, I, when I've used FaceTime, it hasn't ever really worked too well. I've tried it a few times. Um, Messenger, I might have tried it once and the connection just wasn't too good. And, of course, because I like to record my lessons, um, I don't like using a platform that can't do that. But you know what? If you're, if it's just, like, the only option, then at least you have some options. Now, Google Hangouts, you control from uh, inside of YouTube, and there's lots of videos and things like that which will help you uh, set that up. So we're going to talk about Zoom because, and if you've done the course over Zoom, you know exactly what we're talking about, uh, but we're going to talk about why it is that we like this particular platform. Is there anything else you wanted to say, Kaya? I can just say that um, if it's students that you normally would see in person um, who you're giving like an alternative to, uh, you might want to hear what they're comfortable. So if they go, oh, Zoom, that sounds scary. You, you know, you might try out on Facebook and say, and you could actually like almost, almost say, well, yeah, Facebook Messenger is great. We'll, we'll meet on there and then say, well, have you tried Zoom? Because And then, you, you know, when they see your face and everything, they, they might remember that you're there for them to find out how, how each of these platforms work. I mean, today I had um, a tutorial on FaceTime because she was a bit worried about like the scariness of downloading Zoom. Um, and then we were speaking on face, uh, FaceTime because she's used to FaceTiming family and that wasn't a barrier to entry. Uh, one of my choirs um, are a little bit worried about like the whole idea of learning something new. And, and I think you, you have a couple of options there that one is to whatever your if you love google hangouts and it's got great features you know then do a little video how to do that so that um you break down the barrier for your clients mm, yeah that's a good idea uh, i have to say you're kinder to yours than i am because <laughs> i say this is what i use click click the link and follow the instructions yeah well, so. normally i do that normally i say i use zoom but things are a bit different when you have a, a pandemic. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes. Enough stress as there is without adding to it. <laughs> okay, so Zoom can, um, there's a variety of different levels, uh, but really you're either going to work with the free level or the next level up, which is around £11.99 per month. And some of the advantages with Zoom, I feel, are that there's a free version, so you can just try it out. It means, though, when you do a lesson, you will have to start the session again after 40 minutes because you only get um, a 40-minute allowance. Yep. It's a much more stable platform, i found, than, say, um, Skype, because I certainly used to teach on Skype a lot. But when I came over to Zoom, I noticed that the camera was much more... Um, oh, sorry, the video was much more stable and there wasn't so much lag time either. Um, you can record the lesson either to the host, but there's only about one gig of uh, memory there, which, I, if I remember correctly, is about two hours of a videoed session. But you can also 
uh, record to your computer. And of course, then that's brilliant because you can actually, um, you know, record as much as you need to. You can, you can choose where to actually save it. So if you want to go to an external hard drive, that's fine. Or you can do it um, up to um, uh, Dropbox or somewhere, but though it's probably easier just to start off by saving it to your computer. You can schedule different um, sessions. Um, you can have up to 100 participants. So if you decide, actually, I'm really enjoying this, I want to do more of a class option. And I highly recommend that, you know, as a business that you're doing things beyond just one to one lessons. So you That's can have, it. yeah, go on. No, I think I had my debut of over, I've had like five to 10 people before, but I had a lecture with my academy today of had 36 participants. And, um, you know, apart from the whole, you got to mute everyone so that they either put the hand up, there's a hand raising function or put things in the chat because if everybody tries to talk at the same time, it's, it's, it's a mess, but it worked really well um, as, as a tool. Yeah. Also for lectures. Well, I've been on Zoom when there's been 100 people. Uh, but basically, they controlled it by saying everybody's muted and, you know, the talk was delivered and you could ask questions through the text. So obviously, the other advantage is that you can use computer and mobile devices. You can actually also use a telephone so people can just phone in. And they have, they have a waiting room feature so that um, if you've got a bunch of uh, singers coming to have lessons, the next student waits in the waiting room until you're ready and then you say goodbye to your previous student and then you click a little button and you, in, you, know, you allow the other person waiting into the room. So there's lots of things and we're going to do a little demonstration of a lesson uh, between Kyra and myself. This this picture is from um, when I had a little nap before I put my lippy on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, okay, so yeah, there's lots of things um, that we can do within Zoom. Uh, so Kaya uh, sourced this useful tutorial. We, we're still kind of following it up at the moment, but we thought we'd include it because we think it'd be useful in particular for when you're giving lessons, you can actually improve the audio quality so that there isn't that kind of lag time. And um, this guy, Jim Douse has actually, is it, oh no, some, how do you say that? Jim Douse, Yadness, yeah. Yeah, Yana, Jim, just say Jim from <laughs> Denmark. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Professor MG. Jim. Professor Jim. Jim, yeah, Prof. Jim. Yana, it'll be Yana. Whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just going to call him Prof. Jim. Has done this very handy little video to help you to figure out how to turn on this facility uh, so that the sound is better at um, the students' end as well as yours. Yeah, and it's actually demonstrating using, um, well, jamming or using a, a multi audio which neither me or Lynn have, have actually used yet so we thought including his tutorial who's actually experimented it um, would be useful for you mm. oh yeah so that leads well into teaching in groups i see how we did it in this order uh, <laughs> so many of you might be teaching group class um, if it's choir there is still even with whatever uh, things that I've tried out so far, it's still difficulty to actually do an effective um, group singing exercise. Um, it, there's too much delay. There's the, yeah, it just doesn't work with the whole ducking. Ducking is when like when one person speak, it kind of takes everybody else down. So it's not really great for harmony singing. So there's a few different things. I have my very first, internet choir rehearsal tomorrow I, I might be able to share my experience on that after i've done it uh, and i'm planning to do a rehearsal track where i sing all the harmonies um as before and send that across so that or 
perhaps that that's what we're doing. So I'll, I'm giving everybody their notes, their um, their parts, and we meet, and then we all see each other and have the social element. I mean, I have a lot of people who um, are in the risk category of going out uh, in these times, and they're not necessarily the most uh, te technologically advanced users. They're not. Um, uh, what's it called digitally uh, uh, native so <laughs> I think that's actually a term. so I, I have to kind of make sure it's really easy to take part in but at the same time also um, engaging for the younger members and um, I found that for me the best way seems to be pre-recording everything um delivering it as i would in choir but with like the choir member muted taking questions taking clarifications and then us all singing together with essentially what would be the backing track at the end but i'm not sure how it's going to be it's going to be my first time um there are a few different things that i'll put in the pdf as well like gareth malone is doing like a, a whole like thing i think with bbc where like nation singing together um, and there are a few other kind of initiatives because of, I mean, choir is such an important thing. I did part of my MA on, on the mental and physical health benefits of, of, of being in a choir and so much of it is social, uh, you know, it's reducing cortisol hormones and increasing adrenaline and dopamine, which is like basically taking down the negative stress and like increasing all the happiness. So, uh, I don't want the entire nation to just like be on a halt with all of this kind of positive singing thing. Um, Zoom is great for like sh things like sharing screens for lectures. In some ways it's better than having a whole classroom of people uh, because you know exactly where to focus. You decide when you want other people to hear each other, when you're taking questions. If you're easily distracted, it's, it's, it's a blessing. <laughs> um, you want to remember at one function on Zoom, uh, which is as you press the share screen function, there's a couple of options at the bottom. That one of them is called share sound. The other one is uh, optimal for uh, full screen. I find the second one is less important unless you are looking at things like MRI or like really geeky stuff uh, but the first one the share sound if you're actually playing something over your um like something from your computer if you put this press share sound then they will actually hear it as well as you will hear it so that's an important one um yeah and, and, and i think everybody will appreciate the effort because you know we're all working out how to deal with this kind of situation and uh, and the social aspect is super important. Yeah. So some of this is a bit of experimentation, isn't it? For sure. And ho hopefully the teachers will also share their experiences and help other people who are maybe newer to it. Oh, please do. I hope we have loads of Q and A's underneath and, you know, we'll play into it. And, and we're not uh, putting ourselves forward as like the absolute experts on, on, the subject we're just two people who've been using this tool before we needed to and now there's loads of people who have to kind of delve in on without the preparation so that's what this video is about okay so Kaya and I are going to do a little demonstration so you get a sense of uh, what it is that you might have to consider so one of the first things is to make sure that the student realizes that you won't be able to play the keyboard whilst they're singing and that can yeah <laughs> intimidate some people a little bit you know, especially if they're used to always having um, an accompaniment. Uh, so if I have somebody like that, I generally start with just small scales. You know, I might just do triads or three note scales. You know, don't necessarily go launching into the long scale in that instance. Can you hear my stomach just grumbled? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing about internet. You probably could have in the real world. <laughs> Well, keep that in. <laughs> it is to that time. Yes, yeah, so that's something that I make sure I do is that I I make sure that they test it out and try it a little bit and and um, 
if I've been able to have a lesson with them uh, offline, I might actually try it in the studio as well, just to get them used to the idea. So the first thing I'm going to do is to say, okay, Kaya, I'm going to ask you to sing this scale and I'm going to demonstrate it to you and then I'm going to play the actual scale. But when you sing it, I'm going to just play the, the chord or the first note to get you started. So Kaya's going to do, for instance, um, ba, ba, ba. So she's going to do ba, 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 ba. So just this scale. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, and so I just continue like that. Now, if Kyle was struggling with that, I might then make that scale smaller, maybe three notes, uh, or just do uh, two notes. Um, what was the other thing I was thinking about as you were doing that? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so say, for instance, uh, Kaya wasn't a very experienced singer and not, you know, hadn't done scales before, I might actually say to her, I'm going to play the chord and then I'm going to play the scale. And now you sing the scale. be a little less intimidating for someone if they're not used to singing a cappella. And singing a cappella is challenging. And I always say to students, this is so good for your ear, because if you can start to pitch off uh, in your own head rather than always having to have accompaniment, that's going to advance you as a singer and as a musician. So I kind of um, what's the word, spin it that way, you know, for somebody who's maybe struggling. And they may come out with some weird notes for a while, but they will also start to get used to it. And I definitely have had that experience where students in the beginning, actually even professional singers, were not very good at that. And then after about the third lesson, their brains had started to uh, understand what was required. For sure, and and actually, I think that's a, the spin thing is it, it's it's there is an element of that, but it's also <laughs> it's also an element of how, when in the studio do you actually notice that somebody actually struggles to pitch with their internal inner uh, kind of pitching rather than pitching by something external. So so it it can help with that side of thing. Yeah, and in fact, it was during that experience that I realised I did need to do that in the studio. And yeah. so I'd actually go, I'm just going to play the chord because you've done this scale so many times now, you should be able to do it, you know, without me having to play it. And uh, sometimes I'll use the excuse where I say, I need to just, I uh, need to be listening to your voice and so I don't want to play at the same time. So I kind of make it as it's, you know, something to do with me. But actually what I'm really doing is just helping them to become more self-sufficient um, in, in pitching. Same with rhythm as well, like not, not actually setting the rhythm, see if they can maintain that internal pulse. Yeah. So there is definitely yeah. an element. The other one is um, um, like the whole idea of uh, uh, self accompaniment. Some people might not think of like bringing the guitar into the studio or, or playing their own chords, but like when, in um when when the the option of you playing it for them they might all of a sudden go well that's better than a cappella so you might be able to push their comfort zones and we all know that the best learning happens with one foot outside and one foot inside the comfort zone yes so when i'm um, doing the long scale i tend to break it up and so i might start with a so we do that for a little while and then i'll say okay we're going to do And then I'll get them really comfortable with that. And then I'll go, now we're going to do. So 
So rather than just throw somebody straight into that long scale if they've never had to sing a cappella, I'll build them up into it. Any other tricks that you use, Kaya? Um, well, if they're good with music theory, I might go, um, like if they, if they don't know that scale, I might go root third fifth, root third fifth, and then root third fifth, down on the dominant scale, and like that kind of thing. Yeah. Just saying yeah, random so things at them. Utilising lots of different ways of helping that person learn. I mean, the big difference of being in the studio, especially if you're somebody who usually accompany your students, um, if you do that, you can't hear them. So then it's basically them, them practicing by themselves and, and you playing piano by yourself. It's, it's not really you listening to them and giving them singing feedback. There's a validity, uh, there's a validity to that, but it's not um, the same as, as you listening and accompanying like you would in the studio. Um, if that's your process, consider uh, sending them the accompaniment before, um, or especially if you're going for grades and things like that, where you know exactly what they're going to be rehearsing. Um, if they are more like an artist kind of, um, pop artist, singer songwriter kind of type, they probably will self accompany so you won't have as much of a problem. Um, if they perform with backing tracks, whether you have chosen the backing tracks or they've chosen them themselves, uh, they shouldn't be playing that from the same sound source as the one that they're recording uh, onto because that will be a distortion and you definitely won't be able to hear them. Generally, I find most students will have either, like if, they, if they're on a computer, they'll have a smartphone, or if they are doing the same, um, they'll have a Bluetooth speaker. So you can say, okay, well, like the most normal one will be, okay, I'm on my tablet for the recording, so I'm gonna play the backing track off my, uh, off my phone. And I ask them to put it a little bit further away because I'd rather hear their voice. The backing track is more for them than for me. I, I don't, apart from like really seriously rhythmical issues, I don't really need to hear the backing track. I want to hear their voice and how I can like progress that. So that's a big one. Um, yeah, that's my main ones. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a bit of experimentation, isn't it, as well? Just don't worry about, you know, especially if it's new to you and it's new to them, just say, well, we're both learning together and seeing what works. And, um, and eventually, you know, after a few lessons, you'll start to realise, you know, what works for you and what doesn't. And you'll understand about lag time and about playing, you know, at the same time as someone singing. So just um, start small, uh, gradually, and um, and just be reassuring the student all the time that it's okay, we're still progressing. I think a lot of people are actually quite surprised at how far you can still progress online. There seems to be some kind of a perception that it's not as good a quality of a singing lesson when it's done online, but I haven't experienced that. Not at all. No, it, there's something really focused about it because, you, you, I mean, when you're here, you, you're 100% there. Yeah. Um, it's it's different sometimes in a studio. Um, yeah, I've come to really enjoy it, and, and it's not what like my husband says it's because I can like teach you my pants, but <laughs> disclaimer, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I could. <laughs> yes, I'm not to stand up. I, I mean, I do enjoy the whole fact that I, I I literally could get up 15 minutes earlier and and look ready, you know. Mm. I mean, this is night time, so that's not not what happened now. But that there is an element of, of the convenience. But I, I just, I mean, even today, I had a student who started talking to me a little bit more. Like, so like we say, it's less personal. It can be because you're not person to person, but especially with the younger students, um, I'm talking about like university students, um, they are so used to communicating online that in some ways it kind of became a barrier broken down. Right, right. So while well, like with kind of <laughs> my generation and older, it might, it might be more like, a, oh, need to overcome this barrier to be able to feel natural. But I think with the younger generation, it's more like a, oh, 
it's like being on Snapchat. <laughs> so it's, I think it's got positives and negatives. Um, I've become really fond of the fact that I can be available to students because I travel so much, so. Yeah. So do you record the video and the audio that you send to the student or do you just send them the audio? Um, yes and no. <laughs> Um, I allow them to record if they have the facility and if they have the bandwidth. And that's more than anything about admin capacity and also I need to take time to clean my computer and have more. Um, so I do have a, a memory stick that I can put things onto and put it into um, a Google Drive. I tend to use Google Drive or Dropbox depending on what the student is more familiar with um, and send things over. But at the moment, like I've, I really like it if they can just record, especially because it's GDPR and um, maintaining and remembering to email every six months about maintaining things on data, all that kind of stuff. I kind of stay out of it as much as I can. Of course, if you're good at having the Google uh, or not other <laughs> other products available, the forms in the beginning saying that you know, you may maintain uh, some of the recordings for future, rec what's it called? What, what do they say on the, uh, for training purposes? Mm -hmm. You know, then it's fine. Uh, I don't enjoy thinking about those things, but in this day and age, I think it's a necessary evil. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, hopefully that was helpful. We've got our tips. So I'm going to go back to our presentation so we have compiled our top 10 tips on how to teach online so this is from me and Lynn and we wanted to get it out to you quickly so there's obviously loads of other things we might not have thought about you might have other questions please do get in touch you know how to find us on the Facebook group or normal channels that you normally find us the first one is don't try and replicate an offline lesson it is a different beast as I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of it, but it's slightly different. So adjust your pace and your approach. You know, look at what the student is, what kind of signals they're sending out and start from there. Hmm. So the next one is checking, first of all, what your student's goal is. So if they're wanting to do a song, you should probably let them sing the song in its entirety before you start honing in. Um, because it's a little easier, um, obviously, when you're offline to come in and do little bits of correction but it's not going to be as easy when you're online so if they choose you know to sing a song because they're getting ready for an audition or performance or something then let them sing it in its entirety first and then hone in yeah um it's a good thing to have headphones so that you can prevent delay and really focus in on the voice However, if the headphone sets are Bluetooth, that's probably going to work in a negative. If they are working from a smartphone, their hands-free sets um, tends to be really good at picking up sound. Just try and work different ways and always have a kind of um, approach where, like, try not to be frustrated about the technology and just try different things out. Mm. So another useful thing is to set up signals. Uh, so if somebody's singing, obviously it's not going to be easy for them to hear you make comments or to ask them to stop. So I usually say when you're singing, if you just keep an eye out, if I do this, that means stop. Or if I'm going like that, keep going. And the other thing I will do sometimes is I'll say, keep an eye on the chat box because I'm going to write some instructions as you go. You know, it might be that you want them to drop their jaw a little bit more or to um, bring their tongue forward or, you know, whatever it is, the instruction or add a little cry, whatever it is, you can add it into the chat box and they can read it as they're singing. Yeah. And you can actually combine those. I mean, like those kind of things as well, but do, those kind of things that you would do in the studio but maybe you have to bring them up a little bit in the same way as on stage versus in the studio you might have to go bigger you might have to uh, but nothing will work unless you have internet that uh, can bring it across and uh, if you are in a static studio ethernet is great because it will definitely be more stable than wi-fi um, 
fiber optic tends to be more stable than your kind of general um, broadband. But if it's a basic internet, then make sure that you and them shut down anything unnecessary devices and apps. Uh, if I'm in the studio, I'm actually better off tethering on my phone than I am using the internet because the soundproofing is so heavy that me putting uh, the phone close to the window tethering is going to be much more effective. Mm. So we already talked about you can't play the piano whilst the student's singing, whether that's in the scales or song. So demo the scales first uh, on the piano and also with your voice, play a chord or the first note. And as I demonstrated with Kaya, you can also each time play the whole scale just to remind them what the notes are that they need to sing. Yep. Um, if you're using backing track, uh, depending on the level of the student, you might want to send them the backing track in advance. Um, some, there are loads of karaoke tracks on YouTube, on Spotify. Um, on Spotify, quite a few of them have the demo track as well. So if they're not as advanced, they can practice with the demo track and then work with the same karaoke track. So loads of different things like that. But when they are singing, when they are performing, mute yourself because then you will be able to hear them better. So simplify your accompaniment um, if you're actually going to help them uh, with the song. And as Kai was saying, you know, plan ahead, send them backing tracks ahead of time. So you may need to just think things out a little bit more than you might in a normal lesson um, to make sure that they've got what they need, whether it's the music or the backing track or a demonstration of, of the song. Um, because you know, it might be easier if they do some of that revision before they come into the lesson rather than be learning it in the lesson, which obviously offline is a lot easier to do. Yep. And make sure that the position isn't compromising the posture. So, um, you know, get them to stand, adjust the device position. So like right now I'm sitting, I'm probably much better standing and, and putting my uh, device somewhere where I can stand up in a better singing position. I mean, at this point, uh, if they are somebody you've been teaching offline, then that shouldn't be as much of a problem. But like, I like to refer to the, the three cylinders, the one around your hip being aligned with the one around your ribs, being aligned with the one around your head. And you might, if that's the kind, whatever your way of describing a good, um, healthy posture, you might say, are you sitting or standing in a way that is, aligning those three cylinders or whichever way your way of saying it is. Yeah, so the final one is uh, be patient. Patient with yourself, patient with your student. Don't sweat that small stuff. Um, get some guidelines uh, for, set up some guidelines for internet disruption so that if something happens, you're not suddenly in a panic. So be thinking ahead. So. You know, there's times when I'm working online where I'll say, look, if for some reason the internet's going to get interrupted, I will get back on as soon as I can. If it's not working, I'm going to text you or I'll um, send you an email so that you know what the line of communication is. And, you know, it might be that you can't continue that day. And so you reassure them that you'll continue the lesson at some other point and maybe you discuss not charging them or only charging them a portion of, of the uh, fee. So that's it from us. I hope that was helpful for you. Um, it's kind of a new adventure really for a lot of you to go out and uh, start doing uh, online teaching. See it as an adventure. See, you know, sometimes in the face of adversity, new opportunities arise and you might find that you love teaching online and that actually this is something you're going to do more of as you go forward. Um, if you don't, then we can probably trust eventually the, uh, the virus will go away and we can get back to normal. Um, but, you know, for now, I think it's about being adaptable uh, flexible and just taking what resources you have and utilizing them in order to continue doing what you love doing and earning a living. So anything else you want to say Kaya before we head out? That's basically it. Um, the good thing with if you wanted to try out Zoom you can have up to 40 minutes 
So I said, um, after 40 minutes, uh, you can still log in on the same schedule meeting. Uh, just remember to tell your student this is going to cut off and then log in on the same if it's an hour lesson, obviously. Uh, if you're doing half an hour lessons, you don't even need to do anything. Uh, there has been chats about um, Zoom potentially wavering the fee for a month while all this is going on. I haven't seen any actual physical evidence of that yet, but um, um, yeah, let's let's all kind of try and be positive to whatever we can do because there's definitely one thing we can't do anything about and that's uh, the way we all have to take care of the wider goods uh, of uh, not uh, spreading anything so uh, I think it's great to be able to utilize what we have and then in healthier times it's still a great tool to be able to teach online yeah thank you thanks bye, bye. Do, 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 do.